down. It's, it's getting there. It's, it's the the decibels are yeah. low here. Yeah, it's getting there. Hey, obviously, I'm not Charlie, uh, but I'm going to start off like we always do with prayer requests. Is there other prayer requests that are not up there that need to be up there? And I do have to read you all this before we do this because, man, our God is faithful. Let's see. So... We, we've only been here, Melissa and I have only been here for, well, we've been over here a little over a year, but Jean's brother, does everybody know Jean? Mm -hmm. She's in here, okay. Well, Charlie sent me this yesterday, and y'all may know or about this already. The following text is from Jean. Her brother, we have been praying for. Whew, man, I just get <laughs> chills thinking about that. Uh, he has been missing, and we've been praying for him for many weeks. Raising a hallelujah. Praise be to God. My brother Jimmy finally turned up. Oh, they God. found him in ICU at a hospital in Wichita, so we still need to keep praying for him. Uh, he had two big heart attacks and broke his arm when he fell during the heart attack. He's been there since the 9th of July, but doesn't remember anything before the 12th. Uh, I shouldn't say July. I'm not sure. I just assume that. My nephews have been to see him, and my brother will go see him as soon as possible. I can't tell you what a relief it is. It's been over a year of not knowing where he is. So relieved, so very relieved. So praise God. I mean, that, man, that's so cool. You know, it, that's one of the things I struggle with many times. You know, we put out prayer requests, but sometimes we don't know what the results are. You know, people... We're quick to put the prayer request out, but we're not always quick to go, well, here's how God answered it at the end of the day. And so I know there's a lot of things that God does that we pray for, but then sometimes we never know what the final outcome is. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do like Charlie. I'm going to keep my eyes open, but if y'all will bow your heads, I'm going to pray for the <laughs> prayer request. Father God, we uh, come to you this morning just... Uh, Man, grateful and thankful for another day, a beautiful day. Father, we just, um, we love you. We praise you. Uh, as humbly as I know how, Father, we just come before you and just, we lift up these prayer requests to you. Um, Father, there's so many people that uh, are sick. Uh, Tish, uh, Jacob, uh, we've got Madison, Father, we've got... Um, Bradley Fair, we've got Steve Walker, um, we've got Tanya, Lord, I'm just looking through these, we, uh, if anybody I've missed, God, you know each and every one of these, we've listed them up here, and just, uh, Father, we just ask that you would heal them, you know, as believers, God, we know that we can ask you for divine healing. We know that sometimes healing comes through doctors, uh, Father, and Lord, we know that you are uh, perfect, and uh, God, we just trust in your sovereignty in each one of these cases, God. Lord, I, I just praise you again for Gene's brother, uh, just finding him. What a relief uh, I know it is to Gene and the family. We continue to lift up Jeff's dad, uh, Father, to you. Just his healing of um, the loss and just uh, father others up here. We know that Haley uh, lost her father. We know that um, uh, there was another one, uh, Amanda Roberts, God. Uh, others on this list that have lost loved ones that, God, we just need your healing in their lives, their, their comfort. I lift up uh, my neighbor to you, Linda, that lost her husband just last week, Father. And just, uh, Lord, just the hole in our hearts uh, from loved ones, God. We just pray your comfort upon them. Father, uh, I just lift up uh, Kelly to you uh, in his job interview, Father. Just, uh, he's had that. And uh, it's kind of a waiting game, Lord. And just... Uh, Father, we just pray, we pray Kelly gets the job, uh, most of all, and Lord, we just pray for a peace during this time. We can be so anxious, Father, and you tell us to not be anxious for anything, so we, we lay that at, at your feet, Father, and Lord, just uh, for Sharon, uh, Lord, she told me this morning that uh, her mom is doing 
better, and uh, but there's others at the nursing home that uh, still are dealing with COVID. Father, we just pray for healing in their lives. Uh, Sharon has some things going on, just uh, she needs to sell her mom's house, and Lord, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that go into that, from getting the house ready to getting an agent. To, Lord, we just pray that it would sell quick, and Lord, hey, selfishly, Father, I just pray that it would sell for a great price, God, and just because uh, uh, I know that would help uh, them and their mom, and just uh, she has some relatives coming in, and just, uh, Lord, just, just in the short time, just uh, know that that's going to be a little bit maybe trying, and just pray that, God, you would just uh, uh, give that uh, time uh, a blessing and, and time to be together. Lord, we pray for Charlie's friends that uh, uh, don't know the situation, don't need to, but uh, there was a loss there, God, and just uh, pray that, again, you would uh, give them healing. I want to lift up the prayer team that was mentioned last week that's going around the schools and just uh, lifting up the teachers, the, the students, uh, all that goes into to that, Father. Just, uh, Lord, there's a battle for the minds of our kids these days, God. Just, Lord, I just pray that you would put a hedge of protection around our schools, yes. uh, the, the kids, Father, that um, you would protect them. Father, we just pray for little baby Jr. for Emmy and Joseph. Just uh, continue to uh, for his he, uh, growth as as just a little baby. We pray for Adam and Natalie and uh, their little one, and just a job for for Adam, Lord. And uh, we lift up Madison to you. Just uh, Lord, just continue healing in uh, her memory and uh, Lord for their family. Just as Jason's deployed, God. I, there's a lot of things that, that have to be taken care of, and I know that uh, Jason is um, struggling just uh, as a dad, a husband, and just uh, not struggling in the sense of what am I going to do, but just wanting to be there, Father, and I just pray that you would give that whole family peace, uh, Lord, and just, Father, I pray that I haven't missed anybody on here, that I'm sure that there's other Requests, Father, that are on people's hearts that maybe not even uh, on this list up here, God. Just pray that you would um, meet each one of us at the point of our need, the point of our prayers. We lift those up to you. Most of all, God, we just praise you for the God that you are, the Lord that you are, King of Kings, Father. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 John Wood, sign in. Um, you know, I was going to do this, and I forgot, <laughs> uh, so if I don't write things down. So, remember Charlie and Janice and Pastor Bob and Miss Linda? You know, they're, they're on vacations, but, uh, you know, just that this would be a blessed time for them, that they would have rest and relaxation, but, uh, you know, as husbands and wives, that they could just, you know, be knit together even more than they are today. I mean, and just that they would have a blessed time uh, while they're away. Uh, so Charlie should be back next week. Uh, Pastor Bob, they're out for this Sunday and next, and uh, just be lifting up Josiah as he brings the message, and we'll pray for him a little bit later. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Sherry has an announcement to make. Okay. Um, so Vacation Bible School is coming up in 16 days. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, whoa well, is, is uh, exactly right. Because we are in desperate need of leaders. There's only a few positions that are taken in terms of uh, the directors over certain areas. And so tonight there's a meeting at 6 o'clock up here at church. And what will be covered is for anyone who is interested in serving in any capacity. Let me tell you this way. Last year we had to have uh, 66, was it 66 kids and almost 50 leaders or something like that. We need a lot of leaders and if you look at the list of who was involved last year and things that have happened to people this year that are knocking, knocking them out and knocking them down, we need as many people as possible. We need someone to head up snacks, we need someone to head up games, we need um, leaders who are willing to walk around with the groups of kids to take them from Bible study to science. I know that Robin, with being out of town a lot, she needs someone to help her 
uh, with doing the totally terrific science. What is exciting is the theme this year. It's done by Answers in Genesis and it's called Zoomerang. It's mm -hmm. basically about Australia and the land down under. But um, this is a booklet we got for all the kids and then all the leaders. It is the importance of life. You're looking at the preborn, the importance of babies, and that this is really important in light of kids going back to school this fall. And basically, we're trying to gird them up with what God says before they go back to school. And then it's for those who perhaps have ailments or disabilities or other challenges, but the importance of life, and then the aged and the elderly. Um, if there is, if life is important, you were created on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. So uh, anyone who's interested, we really need leaders. Um, too much has happened, so this is the first meeting Josiah's been able to get together tonight at six. Very, very important. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Mark, I'd like to share just a little bit of a commercial tie into that. Mm -hmm. It'll be quick, I promise. You're good. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're going to listen. You're listening to me. Uh, several points. It talks about having a, a, a singular purpose in the church when Paul when Paul's talking Amen. to you. And there's a word that comes to mind for me, and that is synergy. And it's a $50 word, but what it boils down to, if Mark can lift 100 pounds, and if I maybe can lift 100 pounds, you'd think that together we would just be able to lift 100 pounds. I mean 200, 200 pounds, but not so. 250, 275, that's how that synergy, it's a multiplier effect. And that's a challenge for Christians today. Amen. Now, just a short rabbit trail here. Going on in our community, temple community, uh, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee has been formed by the City of Temple. It's been hijacked, it appears, by a sexual movement, a homosexual movement. And that is going on uh, in, in the community. Not only has it been hijacked, but it's, they're proposing to spend thousands and thousands and thousands of our tax dollars promoting this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take away from our, our children's act thing, but if you're at all inclined wanting to know more about what's going on, this granny sitting beside me, <laughs> she knows that stuff. You can talk to her. So Awesome. That's I, I was a great lady in because single-minded focus is what we're going to talk about. So, I think you have one over here too. Oh, yes, yeah. Sir. I don't mean, uh, y'all are in a great mood and got a good vibe going. <laughs> I don't want to ruin that. Um, but this is going to do it. My <laughs> Uncle Paul's stepdaughter, I don't know her name, um, has two of them, had a miscarriage and is having complications and is in the hospital and was given medications and she's not getting any better. So. Needs a lot of prayers on that one. They live in Al um, well, Mobile, Theodore, Alabama, that area. So, so we'll put that. So you don't know her name? I don't. I, I don't. Okay. Uh, How do I describe that? Uh, daughter with a miscarriage. Uh, Curtis's, so you could say second cousin. I guess that's what she would be. Curtis's second cousin. Curtis's second cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's Sorry. important. Sorry. <laughs> Just put Curtis, uh, cousin. Mm -hmm. Miscarriage. <coughs> and she's not doing well. And no. she's not doing well. Mm -hmm. Nope. Thank you for saying. Mm -hmm. Did everybody check in here? Yes. Good. You did your job. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, this brand new first time visitors. Another good week coming up <laughs> because you did your job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you about the whip you used. Oh, no. No. <laughs> Okay, well, let's continue our journey through Philippians, uh, the joy epistle. Uh, you know, just by way of quick introduction, you know, the, the first week we talked about the joy of remembrance, the joy of intercession, participation, <laughs> anticipation, and affection. Then we kind of led into what can cause you to lose your joy. And then we, last week we talked about the five things that Paul prayed for the church at Philippi. So my first question to everybody is, did anybody, don't raise your hand, it's, it's in the put you on the spot type of deal, I mean, you can if you want to, but 
Did anybody have an opportunity to get their joy stolen this week? You know, I'll be transparent with you. I did. Okay. And and here was my here was my journey, my quick journey in, in that process. Uh, you know, part of the reason it started getting uh, stolen was is because I was selfish. I was yeah. focused on myself. Okay. And immediately, you know, that thing, that person, that God called the Holy Spirit kind of said, hey, Mark, what have you been teaching? I was like, oh, why did you bring that up? <laughs> anyway, so just being, again, honest with you, I wrestled with that. I wrestled with knowing what God calls me to do and actually doing it, Okay. And that was a battle that kind of raged inside of me for a little bit. The good side of that is the Holy Spirit won. Amen. Okay? And uh, that joy was restored. But if you think about that, there are many things in our life, if you look at the things that can steal our joy, that will happen every week. And it's a second by second, minute by minute battle to live the life that God's called us to live at the end of the day. And when I say that, you know, that's not a yoke like the Pharisees used to put, put on, the, on the, the, the Jewish people to weigh them down. It's just what God's called us to do. The flip side of that is God's given us everything to be successful yeah. in that. Does, that. does that make sense? Yeah. It all comes from God. So we're going to talk more about that uh, today. So when we look at Philippians 1, 12 through 26, and I'll tell you, my goal is to finish chapter 1 today, okay? <laughs> That's a goal. Yeah, it's thank, thank you, sure. It's good to have a goal. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's, if somebody could read uh, verses 12 through 26 to start this off for us. I got it. Thank you, sir. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole play, palace, excuse me, guard, and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from good will. The former preach the Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. But then, only that in every way, rather in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on, live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me 
may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Amen. Thank you, sir. So, the title of this uh, I've got is The Joy of Ministry in Spite of Trouble and dis Distractions. Okay, so when you think of ministry, Paul's talking, he's talking to the church at Philippi. He's talking about building the body here. Okay, but now he's kind of shifted and it is kind of focused a little bit on his circumstance as, as he's talking to them. But when you think of Paul's ministry, we all have a ministry or multiple ministries. Okay, it, it's, it's not just pastors that have a ministry at the end of the day. We've got our family, we've got our friends, we've got the interactions of people in our neighborhoods, whatever that looks like. And so... Remember, Charlie told us uh, a month or so ago, when you read the scriptures, it means a certain thing, but it can have different applications, okay? So when we, when we look at this, we're going to talk about what Paul is saying to the church at Philippi, but then try to extract out of it, not try, but look at the lessons that we can apply to our own lives in our own ministries, whatever that looks like for us individually. So... Again, one of our one of uh, I've got on here. Our ministry is the sphere of influence that we live, and God expands. Okay, it has different meanings to different people in terms of who you interact with. But I also wrote here one of the surest measures of a Christian spiritual maturity is what it takes to rob us of our spiritual bestowed joy. So think about that. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, remember. We receive the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, okay? So when we're joyful, for each one of you, what does it take, big or small, for you to lose that joy? You know, does it take something little, you know, in your life that kind of steals that joy from you? I'll be honest with you. What happened to me this week, sad to say, it was, it was an insignificant issue. Okay, but I, I, I let it steal my joy for a very short period of time. You would look at it and say, well, that wasn't very spiritually mature, Mark. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just being honest with you. Now, other days I can go and there can, I can be hit with a lot of stuff, but Keith even started this off. Where is my focus at the end of the day? Okay, if it's on God and I'm living minute to minute, second by second, with my eyes focused on God, I tend to, I can deal with a lot of stuff in my spiritual walk, okay? But if I tend to let my flesh get involved, my maturity goes down real quick at the end of the day. Does that happen to anybody? Okay. I thought it was just me. I was just checking that. <laughs> okay. So Paul is a larger than life example of a man whose joy increased as the troubles of this world grew in his life. I mean, it is amazing, Keith. I mean, when you think about what all Paul went through, you know, Paul was stoned. He was beaten. And most of these were on numerous occasions. He was lost at sea for, I think, two or three days. I mean, literally, in, in the water, not lost in, on a tropical island somewhere. He did eventually get to an island. But he was, I mean, horrendous things. Here we find Paul. He's in house arrest, but he's chained to a guard. I mean, think about that. Just every place he goes, he's got a guard chain to it. So that's the, the, the uh, backdrop of this. John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. As a believer, who likes struggles in their life yeah I, yeah I, I don't find too many people that go yeah i want to grow like paul grew at the end of the day but here's what i would ask and and i know that i can validate it in my own life if i look back at my life and i look at the struggles that god has allowed me to go through because remember everything is filtered through god's hands he could relieve that from me or you if he wanted to.
but he allows us to go through it. And we're going to talk about that more in terms of what God's word says. But as I've come out of that, you remember how I always talk about putting stakes in the ground and my spirit looking back at the things that God's done for me. I'm growing in my spiritual maturity every time I come through one of those the way that God wants me to come through. Every time I trust in him and come out the other side, it's another spiritual marker that I can put in the ground and go, man, there God goes again. He delivered me again. Sometimes, you know, those lessons are for us to learn. As a professional, I've always been trained, my background has always been dealing with problems. So in dealing with problems in the corporate world, it's you're successful in how quick you solve a problem, okay? How quick you can get it off your plate, if you, if you will, okay? Get the company back moving again. But there's a principle in dealing with problems that says, if I have a computer outage, I may can get the computers back up in a relatively short period of time. Let's say minutes, okay? And that's good for the company because they're back up and running again. But if I know in the back of my mind that I didn't know what caused that problem, that problem is gonna happen again, okay? So sometimes the discipline is you have to, instead of getting the systems back up again, you have to collect data. And collecting data takes a while, okay? And as a professional, you've got to bear the pressure of senior management calling you and going, hey, what are you doing? Get these systems back up at the end of the day. But you know in the back of your mind that, oh, if I don't get this data, we won't be able to really solve the problem. So it's kind of an analogy to say in our spiritual walk, sometimes we have to go through some of that pain so that we can come out the other side and enjoy what we have in Christ, knowing that he always is sufficient to carry us through. Does that make sense? Yeah. You could almost call it an epistle of sanctification, right? Because he just talks about the process that we all go through, um, struggling and, you know, going to the top of the mountain and then the valley and the, that, that yep. continually... Absolutely. So, yeah. Yep. So, verses 12, uh, let's see, 12 through 12 and 14. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So, what can we learn as we unpack that? Paul was joyful in spite of trouble as long as Christ's cause was progressed. Mm -hmm. So when we live our lives and our single-minded focus is on Christ, when those arrows of life come in, if we have our minds on Christ and that is our focus, we tend to put it into perspective around that. Does that make sense? Paul wanted the Philippians to understand that as dire as his circumstances seem to be from a human perspective, they have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. He did not ignore or make light of his imprisonment, but it was incidental to his willing, joyous, and immeasurable privilege status as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So where was where was Paul's focus? Yes, sir. I, just a thought there, that just boiling that down in my mind. If we have problems in the physical realm, transitioning those thoughts and those problems into a spiritual uh, analysis of what you know, is going on is what Paul's talking about here, I think. Absolutely. Moving us, God is a spirit. Absolutely. And when we move from a physical problem to the, towards the spiritual, we're connecting with God. And that is kind of, that's what is... A absolutely. Again, that's that single-minded focus of being spiritual-minded, of keeping my mind on Christ while the world still spins around me, but knowing that Christ is in control. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is in Romans 8, 28. It says, all things work together for good. Does God say all things are good? Mm -hmm. He does not. He just says that in your life, I can make good 
out of the bad. Amen. Okay? Isn't that cool? That is cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here, think about this. You know, I, I love this passage. This is Acts 5, 40 and 42. It says, his speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and, then, and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering, disgrace of the, for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. So it, it, it's amazing. I mean, you think about it. They were just flogged. They were told never to mention the name of Jesus again. But because of the flogging, and they're focused on Christ, the flogging was nothing. Wow. Now, how, how does that work? I mean, we all know in our human flesh the pain that you're going to suffer, but yet, man, when they walked out of there, whew, it's overwhelming. But when our eyes are on Christ, <clears throat> everything else kind of aligns around his ability to give us all that we need to come through that. Okay? So, like, like you said, it was, it was an affirmation for them, encouraging them that they were doing doing what they were needing to be doing. Yeah. So I don't know if y'all have ever thought of this. I think about this sometimes. I kind of go, you know, Lord, I think if this happened, I would be strong enough <laughs> to do this. But I don't know. <laughs> because it's never happened to me. It happened to them, and it's exactly what Matt said. They're like, we did. He did give us all that we need, and we came through that. You know, I see him kind of skipping down the road. You know, just kind of, man, we're saved. We're disciples of Christ. Man, I can go conquer the world. Does that make sense? And they took it as that, as, as an you know, an affirmation, not 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 something to be boastful of, but yes. a reassurance that they were doing well. It, it was all personal. It wasn't to the world. <laughs> yes, look at me. It's exactly what you said, Matt. It was like, man, what an affirmation. So, uh, James one, James one, two and three says, consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kind, kinds, plural, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So, you know, you can, you can think of an athletic analogy. You know, to persevere and become number one in athletics, you have to train. It's that constant train and training and taking yourself to the next level that gets you to the top. Does that make sense? Well, guess what? The trials of life are our training. We cannot mature in our faith unless we have trials. We can, we can, you know, Paul said it, you know, you can stay on milk or you can eat meat. But in order to eat meat, you got to mature in the faith. You got to be able to stand up because the arrows are coming, okay? And in the world we live in, I mean, we're already, Keith kind of talked about what is happening to our world today for us the arrows are going to start coming more and more. I mean, I, I just, uh, at least in my perspective, they are. So we can trust in God's word, know that they're coming, but know that God is going to give us all that we need to sustain us. Okay? So number two, verses 15 through 18, this reads, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put there for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. I mean, just in simple terms of reading those, those verses there. I mean, Paul's like, there is nothing that is creeping into his mind. It's all about Christ. Whether it's for goodwill, 
or for not, his mind is there. One of the most discouraging experiences for a servant of God is that of being falsely <coughs> accused. Has anybody ever been here falsely accused? Have you ever been falsely accused by a believer? Man, that hurts. I mean, that really hurts. You know, uh, especially, well, I've got especially co-workers in, in the church sometimes. To be maligned by an unbeliever is expected. The pain runs deep when one's ministry is slandered, misrepresented, and unjustly criticized by fellow teachers and preachers of the gospel. So think about it. Remember, we talked about ministries. Who has family members, I do, you know, that you, know, you try to share the gospel with, but they're unreceptive. Sometimes they're kind of caustic at the, at the end of the day. Sometimes, you know, you hear stories behind your back of things that your family members have said about you, you know, at the end of the day. All of it hurts. But remember, even in spite of these distractor, distractors, if we keep our mind on Christ, it doesn't mean that the pain goes away. It just means that we can suffer through it and deal with it because Christ is going to give us all that we need. Does that make sense? So verse 15 says... In my Bible, it says, it is true, another way of saying that, to be sure. Paul, Paul, he, he's saying, I know this to be a fact. Uh, this is sort of a departure from Paul's main theme of joy. He's saying, I realize full well that everything is not as it should be in the church. I am not naive about the motives of a few pastors and evangelists. I know they are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Their heart was not right. It was not that their theology was wrong, but it was their motives were wrong. They preached out of envy and strife. And so what's the personal application that we can do for our own life, whether it's in ministry or whatever we do in life? Sometimes we can do what we're supposed to, but our heart's not right. We, we do it just because we know that it's the right thing to do. But inside, we're wrestling. Does that make sense? It's no good then, okay? It's only good. It's good that we do it, but if our heart's not right, that's what Paul is challenging. They, he wasn't challenging their theology. What they were teaching was right, but they were doing it to poke at Paul. You know, it was a competition. It was a way to get it. Paul was what they were trying to do, and so their motives were wrong. Their heart was not wrong. They were still preaching Christ. He says, hey, the former do so, but the latter do so out of envy. Okay, so they were all preaching Christ. And then he says, well, what does it matter as long as Christ is preached? Again, back to his focus. Doesn't matter as long as I will take the arrows. Doesn't matter as long as Christ is elevated and proclaimed. Okay, so. The third one, 19 through 21. For I know that through your prayers and for the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So Paul was, pain, was fully confident that despite his negative circumstances, the Lord's cause would triumph. Therefore, he could face death without fear. I shared with y'all, I think it was last week, you know, my sister died of, of cancer. And uh, she had cancer of, of the jaw, but it metastasized down into her body and her hips and her legs and her bones were actually <laughs> swelling up and, and fracturing. And so it was a very painful process. But I talked to her every day. And, uh, you know, what I remember, or not, this is not the only thing, but one of the things that just, it brings me joy every time I think about it is, remember the joy of remembrance that we've talked about? So when I remember my sister, and, and sometimes she would be in a lot of pain, but she would say, my name's Mark. She called me Marky. Okay. <laughs> she would say, Marky, man, God is teaching me so much 
through this cancer? And I would go, Sharon, what are you talking about? And you know, about that time, she'd have to get a morphine sucker because she couldn't, she couldn't mm -hmm. handle the pain. And then it was kind of, she'd lose it, you know, from a mental capacity, it'd take it back. And then I would call her back the next day and she would walk me through something that God was, was teaching her. And I was like, man, if I pray I never have to go through it, but I, if I go through it, I pray that I would go through it like my sister at the end of the day. And then she told me, she, she went to her church and, and everybody in, in her church knew that she was, uh, that she had cancer, she was gonna die. Uh, but she met with all the, the kids, like, like 12 and under. And she met with them to tell her what was happening to her, but then she allowed them to ask her any questions, okay? And the biggest question that they asked her was, are you afraid of dying? Yeah. And she wasn't. Because just like Paul, her focus was on Christ. And for me, you know, that's not something that happened to me, but I hang on to that, praying that if I ever have to go through that, that I will journey through it with joy, just like my sister. So she's my current now deceased Paul, if, if you will, in that same manner. Does that make sense? And I'm sure we've all have experiences like that, but remember the joy, remember the joy of remembrance, to put that stake in the ground so that when difficult times come, I'll be honest with you, I don't think I've ever been through anything that tough, personally, okay? But yet, it gives me much joy to think about that and knowing that God was sufficient to meet her needs, he would meet my needs as well, okay? Uh, so as we look at, uh, let's, let's unpack this a little bit, just 19 through 21. It says, Paul was fully confident that despite his negative circumstances, the Lord's cause would triumph. Therefore, he could face death without fear. So 19a, uh, if we look back at that, it says, for I know, for I know the Greek word oida means to know something with certainty. It's, there's no doubt. It's going to happen. It's sort of like our hope in Christ. That hope is not like, I hope I win the lottery. That's a hope knowing that God is going to carry out what he said he would do. Does that, does that make sense there, right? So 19b, it says, confidence in the prayers of the saints. Paul believed in the limitless sovereignty of God, and God's plan incorporates the prayers of his people. Remember the joy of intercession? That's the prayers of his people. James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So, how many of us would in here raise their hand? You don't have to. If I know somebody's praying for me, man, I just kind of have a bit different view of the world at the end of the day. If I'm struggling through something and I know there's a group of uh, believers that are praying for me, that gives me strength. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it, I can do things that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to do because my flesh would have been involved in and go, eh, I'm not sure I can handle this at the end of the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Paul was a believer of that. He believed in the prayers of the church at Philippi because he knew that they were praying for him. Uh, 19C, confidence in the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. So help and provision describes the full, bountiful, and sufficient supply of what is needed. So remember, we talked just a while ago about God, Jesus, will supply everything we need. This is what Paul's talking about. The health provision describes a full, bountiful, bountiful, and sufficient supply of what is needed. Sometimes it doesn't go beyond. It's just what we need because it's just enough to get us through. Other times, it's bountiful, it overflows. And then 
20b uh, and 21, it says confidence in the plan of God. Paul was not certain what God's plan was for him, whether he would continue to serve and exalt God through his life and ministry or through the final exaltation of death. Either way, the Lord's will would be done. Paul was okay. It didn't matter whether life or death. Remember, he said, it'd be better if I died because then I'm with Christ. But either way, I'm good at the end of the day. I hope I don't ever have to pray that, but I hope that I would pray it the way that Paul prayed it. I mean, whether life or death. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So 22 through 26 uh, says this. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you and again in your joy in Christ, Jesus will overflow on account of me. So I want to be real careful because God says don't add to or don't take away anything in God's word. Those emphasis are for me. When I'm reading that, it, it, it's things that mean something to me. You know, when I, when I, when I read, uh, uh, let's see, I desire to depart be with Christ, which is better, but it is more necessary for you because that emphasis for me is showing me what Paul's mind is. He's thinking about the church at Philippi, you know. He thought it was more. So let's talk about that. We find Paul in a quandary about his life and death, confessing, I do not know which to choose. I am torn between the two. We see Paul determine that to remain in the flesh is more necessary for the church at Philippi. Okay? This shows Paul's love for the Philippians when to be with Christ would be better by far. Paul was convinced that the church still needed him needed his instruction and his leadership. Paul lives out what he is getting ready to write in Philippians 2.4, which we're going to talk about, uh, probably not today. Uh, <laughs> uh, it says in 2.4, uh, each of you should not look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. There's a lot in that that we're going to talk about. I mean, it, it comes at a lot of different angles. So, uh, you know, when, when I always try to bring life lessons into these verses. Uh, Melissa's mom and dad, we call them Papa and Nana. Papa's gone on to be with the Lord. But they met at a very young, young age, were married, and they were inseparable. I mean, inseparable. But uh, Papa pretty much did everything for Nana, okay? I mean, and, and it was his joy, okay? Yeah, I remember early in our marriage, we'd be at, at, the, at the house, and Nana was addicted to Dr. Peppers. Don't know if anybody's addicted to Dr. Peppers. <laughs> okay, but Nana was addicted to Dr. Peppers. I mean, literally addicted to him. And we'd be sitting there at 9 30 at night watching tv and, and uh she said oh man good old cold dr pepper shoe sure would taste good right now and you know we're just watching tv and then i'd look over and I'd say, where's papa a few minutes later papa would come strolling in the door man i got you dr pepper <laughs> <laughs> he's gone down and literally drove down to the Little Seven Eleven down just a block or two down the street and brought her back. Now, it's all about the ice too, Mark. You can't have any ice. Too, right? People got their ice preferences. Over so is, is it crushed ice or you, you know? Is it? You know, yeah. Well, you know, little, little beads. <laughs> little beads. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but now, so so that was just to show you the love that he had for Nana. Now, Papa had his first triple bypass when he was forty. Okay. Then he had a quad when he was sixty-two. Okay. They had another triple when he was 72, okay? Now, fast forward to Papa's end of life. Remember, I told you, Papa did everything for Nana. But Papa realized that he wasn't going to live forever. So he had to start teaching Nana to do some of the things that she needed to do, 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, where all the bills were, you know, where all the bank accounts were. Now, Papa's heart was beating, he was pumping 10% blood. Mm -hmm. And he lived that way for about 18 months, okay? It, it was like running a marathon to get from the chair to the bedroom, to the bathroom. Y'all get it. You understand that. Mm -hmm. My point in telling you that is this. So we were there, and I can remember Papa had done, I mean, he had set the cable bill up, you know. He had consolidated their, their monthly bills with a Walmart deal so that all that stuff was taken care of, and even though he told them. My point is, is that, he was hanging on to ensure that Nana was taken care of. That was his love. That's the same analogy as Paul to say, <coughs> better to be with Christ, Papa, better to be with Christ, but I need to stay here just a little while longer to make sure Nana has all that she needs. And I remember, and I don't know this for a fact, y'all, and I'm, I'm just being as transparent, but I can remember Saturday night, I was there, I was coming through on a, on a business trip, and Pop and I, uh, we were having one-on-one -on -one time, and uh, uh, I can remember looking at him, and I said, Papa, you know that Nana's going to be okay. We're going to take care of her. You don't have anything to worry about. Mm -hmm. Two days later, he passed away. Mm -hmm. But he stayed as long as his, I mean, his body was demolished. Mm -hmm. I only say that to try to make the impact, not look at me, look at this, this example I'm giving you, but just another example. And we probably all have examples in our life mm -hmm where somebody that we can relate to. And so remember, for me, the joy of remembrance. Man, I remember back on that sweet time to go, man, here's a man. I got Paul as an example. I've got Jesus, my, my ultimate. But here I have a man that taught me how to live on this earth with humility and to, to love others. And uh, I hopefully will live up to that. So... I think, ooh, man, I might be getting close. All right, let's see. Okay, so, so in, in that, that was the last one. In spite of being in the flesh, as long as the church benefited, Paul was saying, hey, it's better that I stay. You still need my leadership. You still need my teachings. I'm going to stay. And so that quandary, he, de he decided. So then if we look at <coughs> verses 27 through 30, and that will wrap it up. Uh, if I can get through them. So, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You know, that alone, for us as believers, it's our honor and duty to live in a manner that honors Christ, okay? Uh, then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God, for it has been granted to you on your behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you, have not, since you are going through the same struggles you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So let's see if we can unpack that and, and, yeah. So in these verses, we see that Paul's focus is again on the Philippian congregation now, okay? So what does he talk about? He talks about standing firm. That translates stand, steadfastly holding one's ground regardless of danger or opposition. So think of that in a military perspective, okay? You got to hold the position no matter what. The enemy shooting, doesn't matter. You can't give up your position. That's the holding the steadfastness, whether it's danger, whatever. That's what Paul's talking about. He's also talking about the unity of the body. We're going to get into these in a little bit more. Paul calls on the church to maintain their spiritual commitment. 
sometimes when times get tough, is it is it kind of hard to maintain your spiritual commitment? I know it is for me. I mean, I, again, you got to look back at, at Christ. Uh, I know this is probably a weird analogy, but so most everybody, not everybody's too. So when they used to plow the fields with the mules, what did they stick on them? What did they stick on their eyes? Blinders. Blinders. <laughs> and they stuck the blinders on so that all they saw was what was in front of them. They couldn't get distracted by everything else around them in the world. That's the same concept that as believers we should have is that single-minded focus of looking at Christ, putting him on the throne, and living our lives. Because the world's going to keep throwing. Yes, sir? Oh, this, this is a similar analogy. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I've never been to Rio, <laughs> and I have no desire to go. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, on things I've read, it's a real disheveled city. It's a huge city. There. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, the story is when you get lost in Rio, you look up and find Jesus, because mm. it has the massive, yes. the massive yes. statue, so you know where you are. Yes, you know if he's over there, you know where you are in the city. If he's over there, you know where you are. So that's kind of the same thing. <laughs> total, total. Uh, great analogy. No, great, great analogy. I mean, that's that's, that's spot on. Uh, it's not original, but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna draw something at the end that's not original either, but uh, I'm gonna claim it, you know. Uh, so the church, the church's greatest testimony before the world is spiritual integrity. Okay, integrity. What it, what's the definition of that? Sincere and blameless. It has the idea of not falling into sinful conduct and of not causing others to fall into iniquity. So when we look at our world today and you have a person that you believe, you know, they're big in the church, whatever church, pick, pick a church. And then all of a sudden you hear them on the news tomorrow because some infidelity, some sin. What does that do to our Christian faith? I mean, to, from a world perspective, you know, as they look at us, they go, oh. Don't necessarily want any part of that at the end of the day. So that's what Paul is saying. It's the integrity of the church at Philippi. Keep that integrity. Don't, don't cause anybody to stumble, but you don't stumble either. Ah. When the unsaved look at the church and do not see holiness, purity, and virtue, there appears to be no reason to believe the gospel it proclaims. So when you think about that, that's on us at the end of the day to maintain that. The only way we can maintain it, if I keep my eyes on Jesus, I can maintain it. The minute I get distracted, there's a chance that I may not keep that focus. Uh, standing firm translates uh, the single Greek verb steko, which refers to steadfastly holding one's ground regardless of danger or opposition. Kind of already talked about that. Standing firm is both positive and negative. It is to stand for God and against Satan. We kind of heard the, the against part over here that here's what's creeping into our world today. Okay, well, we have to stand against that as well as standing for God. Uh, to stand for truth and against falsehood. To stand for righteousness and against sin. Verse 27c, in one spirit with one mind. So think about that. One spirit, one mind. Along with standing firm in the faith, there must also be unity within the church. A mutual sharing of convictions and responsibilities in one mind and one spirit. Has anybody I have been in a church that split? I have. And if I look at the root cause of why that church split, it was all people's pride, ego, selfishness. They didn't, and, and in my particular instance, these were men that taught the word of God 
but didn't follow the word of God. Because when you talk about unity of the body, and we're going to jump into that one big time, uh, it comes with a lot of responsibility when you interpret the scriptures. And to throw that aside and you break a church really offends God at the end of the day, I believe. So, verse 29, he also says, standing firm, he says, faith and suffering. In his sovereign grace, God not only gave believers the marvelous gift of faith to believe in him, but also the privilege to suffer for his sake. Such suffering, suffering provides the reward of future glory. Romans 8, 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I must be running out of time here. Um, wow. Okay, so I, I don't want to leave, I don't want to, fast forward through these last couple because it kind of brings all of chapter one into focus so we'll stop with that today any questions sorry i didn't get through that valiant effort pardon me valiant effort, <laughs> valiant effort. it was a goal remember it was a goal. it was a goal it was a goal i ran up to the finish line i didn't cross the finish line all right well let me close this in prayer then father god lord we just uh we come to you and just, uh, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for the breath of life, Father. Thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us each day, uh, Lord, big and small, those things that we don't even recognize many times, God, for, because of your goodness, your love for us, God. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. God, I just, again, I lift up uh, the prayer request, pray for all of us that, uh, Lord, you would lay those on our hearts during this week, that we could lift them up, that we could... Uh, intercede for uh, those that are on these lists and father just uh, lift up Josiah right now pray that you're you would give him a word and that uh, father our hearts would be open to hear that to apply it uh, in our lives God we lift up Charlie and Janice and Pastor Bob and Linda and just again pray that you would bless them during this time we love you we praise you in Jesus name amen, amen.